Okay, last week we talked about a topic, is Jesus in the house? If a person was to look in our window, would they see a church with Jesus in the house, or would they see just a church with a bunch of people in it? Because, see, that makes a difference. See, if you were to really, truly seek the Holy Spirit out, you would go into, how many churches are in this country? Thousands. But how many of those thousands of churches actually have Jesus as the center? How many of those churches actually are seeking God? How many of those churches actually have the anointing of the Holy Spirit? See, going to church doesn't mean you have a relationship with God. Amen? Amen. Going to church, I can go to church every week and be turned off from God and not pray, not read, not study, not seek Him. Could literally care less about Him. But out of religious duty, I can come to church and think I'm covered. That's what a lot of Christians think they're covered. And that's not the Church of Jesus Christ. The Church of Jesus Christ is an active, viable, living organism. Amen? I also read you a story about a pastor that disguised himself as a homeless man. Out of the church, asking for money for coffee. No one gave him any. Came into the church, walked up to the front of the pew. The ushers asked him to go to the back. Because he didn't fit the bill. Amen? Yes. Trying to talk to people and people staring at him, almost telling him that you don't belong here. And when they introduced him as the pastor of the church that was taking over, he was the new pastor. Up comes the bum or the homeless person that was out in the street that you didn't talk to, that was in your front pew. You put him to the back pew who didn't look good, so you wanted him to leave. He comes up to the podium and he introduces himself as the new pastor. And he says to them, what I saw is a church, but I didn't see a church of Jesus Christ. And that's where a lot of us are today. So what I'm trying to get to the point is, the church has got to resemble Jesus Christ. Yes or no? Yes. yes. All the time, right? Each and every one of us are not perfect. Newsflash, hello, no one's perfect. Can we all say amen to that? Amen. Okay. Because we're not perfect, we're going to aggravate people. And people are going to aggravate us. Right? Even within the four walls of the church. And we've got to get real about that. Amen? But guess what? Does God like change? He wants to change you. See, the Bible says God changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But you, he wants to change. He wants to change your self-centered way of thinking into Christ's way of thinking. And he'll put people in your way purposely to annoy you. Purposely to rub you like sandpaper. Isn't that the, have you ever taken sandpaper and just for the sake of it rubbed it on your hand see how it feels? Terrible. Imagine taking rough sandpaper but all over your arm. All over your head. All over your entire body. You wouldn't generally do that on your own because we don't like to suffer. We don't like pain. We don't like discomfort. But guess what changes you? Pain. Discomfort. That changes you. Because if you don't like it, you'll find a way to change it. And when you come into a church, guess what? Change has got to happen. What good is it if you come here and we act the same way as the unchurched out there? And that's where a lot of us are. It's like we'll come to church and we'll be just like the people outside. Now, I'm not saying that we have to be perfect. Trust me, I am a work in progress. Sometimes I can be the, 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 the least Christian-like person on the face of the earth if I'm in a bad mood. Really? Yeah, I can be. But God always gets a hold of me and says, you've got to do something different. And that's where the Word of God comes in. Amen? Okay. So, what should a healthy, thriving church look and feel like? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. Got your Bibles with you? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When you're there, say amen. amen. Before I begin, what's, what drew you to God? Well, pastor, you know, I was searching and I found God. Okay? That's a lie. Because God found you. How did God find you? By His love for you. His love drew you. His love wooed you from the foundation. Before, listen, it amazes me. Before you were even thought of by mom and dad, God was drawing you by His Spirit. 
God's love drew you. So understand that the premise of the church is L O V E. Amen? Okay. Let's pick it up in, for, in chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, that's love, I have become a sounding brass or a thinking, tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long, it is kind. Love does not envy, it vaunteth not itself, it is not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we have prophecy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is a part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, and, but not face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am also known. And now abideth faith, hope, and love. But of the three, the greatest of these is love. And I'm going to tell you again, love is not a feeling. Hello? Love is an action. If I see somebody homeless, do I know that person? Can I love that person? Yes. If I love that person, is that love a feeling or is it an action? It's an action. It's an action. Why? Because I have to come out of myself and say, I'm going to help that person. When the Holy Spirit gives you an unction to do something, do it. You and I, as a church, when you look in the mirror, you can't see who you are. You have got to see Jesus in you. Does that make sense? Because if you don't, you won't operate the way God wants you to operate because you're thinking it's you that's doing it. And nine out of ten times, you won't do it. You've got to be in so in love with Jesus that you see Jesus in you. Right. And that love of God, because he draws you, filters out through you into other people. That's when the church becomes a viable living organism, when it doesn't seek its own. Does that make sense? Jesus went around and he ministered to people that needed help. He was a healer. He was a deliverer. He shed his blood. Each and every one of us, if we've accepted Jesus Christ, we, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Not because you and I did anything, but because he did it. As Christians, we need to go out into this world and show people who Jesus really is and what Jesus is really like. And the only way we can do that it's through how we are, how we allow him to live through us. Does that make sense? Yes. If it makes sense, then we've got to come out of ourselves every single week, every single day. I've got to come out of this Mario shell and put on Christ every day yes. to get out there and be a minister to advance the kingdom of God. Because if you don't, you are not effective. And in effect, we have, listen, you can go to churches on every corner. Millions of people in churches across the country. And I can tell you, three quarters of them are not Christ like. That's a shame. Because that's not true. You're walking in a lie. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Is Jesus in the house? Let's turn to Matthew 22. When you're there, say amen. Matthew 22. Go to verse 35. You there? It says, And then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Gee, Jesus is kind of telling you kind of self-centered there, aren't you? Because every one of us, we love ourselves, baby, don't we? Yeah. It's all about me. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> it's all about us. When you go... <laughs> you ever see Facebook pictures? <laughs> Everybody wants to get in there. The world of me. The world of me, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or just, if you just go through your life, how many times do you think about you? How does this affect you? I'm stuck in traffic. I'm going to be late. This is making my day bad. It's all about me. It's all about me. And Jesus said, it's not about you at all. It's about you funneling me through you. Letting me live through you. Letting me be an example to a dying world out there that doesn't even believe Jesus exists. Because today the churches don't portray it that way. You come into a church and people hardly acknowledge you. You come into a church and you're a new person. They don't even recognize you. People are sick. They don't even get a phone call. I'm guilty of it just like everybody else. But we've got to be conscious of that. Has somebody say to me, well, how's so-and-so? I'm like, I don't know. How is he? Well, he was in the hospital. I'm like, what? And my wife said to me, you don't even read your own emails. She got mad at me for that. She goes, you're telling people to read your email and you don't even know what's going on. And you know what the excuse was? Well, I've been really busy. Jesus said, really? You can't be too busy. We need to be busy about kingdom things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. The church has got to love your brother and sister more than you love yourself. Amen. What does that mean? I mean, if you know somebody's not working, not of their own thing, I mean, they're generally out of a job because the economy, make sure that their needs are being met. Now, I'm not telling you to go write a $20,000 check and give it to someone, unless the Holy Spirit tells you to do that. But get people together. Hey, brother so-and-so is out of work. Sister so-and-so is out of work. Let's get together and bless them. Right. We should be watching out for each other. In the second chapter of Acts, it tells you that the church sold everything that they had, gathered together, pulled all their money together, and dispersed as each had need. Now that's commune living. We don't want to do that. But we can do that in the church. We can get together and say, hey, so-and-so has a need. Let's meet it. Not, well, what are we going to do? You alone can't do it, but together we can do it. Do you know what the single thing that, that brought, was brought to my heart yesterday in that, in, that, in that verse? It says they had a singleness of heart. Singleness of heart. Mm -hmm. Meaning their heart wasn't a little bit over here, a little bit over there, my job, the sports, my kids, my wife. No, no. Jesus. Boom. Done. My heart is in Jesus. Period. Nothing else. Now, when you do that, guess what happens? You're a better husband. You're a better father. You're a better wife. You're a better kid. You're a better parishioner. You're a better ambassador. So if this is all common sense, why don't we do it? Because the enemy hates when we act and look like Christ. And he'll trip us up any way that he can to make us look other than that. The biggest thing that I get when I talk to people and say, why don't you go to church? Why should I walk into a place full of hypocrites? That's the answer I get. And I'm saying, well, so when you walked in the door, you became a hypocrite too then. Well, that's why I don't go. I said, no, you don't go because you have no understanding. Because there is no place in this world that has perfection in it. However, however, when I walk in that door, I may not be perfect. But right now, I'm heading on to perfection. Yeah. See, God is changing you. God is changing me. If you allow him to do that, there are people in Christianity, folks, for 20 and 30 years that don't change. Is that God's fault? No. 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 Whose fault is that? Uh, it's us. us. It's us. I could not even imagine wasting my time. Coming to church... You were miserable in 1982. You were miserable in 1992. You are way miserable now. <laughs> I thought God was supposed to change people. He does. He does. If you want to be changed. That's right. If you want to be changed. Romans 12.2 says, 
don't be conformed to the things of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes. Well, gee, how do I do that? Well, pastor, I don't really believe the Bible's true. Then I would challenge you <laughs> to read it. I would challenge you not only to read it, but to do it. And then come back to me in 30 days and tell me this is not true. Because God will make a liar out of you. Because God wants you to change. God desires you to change. <laughs> God desires to put your flesh on the cross and crucify it. Yes, doesn't that sound good? Yes. Get your flesh on that cross and crucify that thing. Because I want you to be made in the image of my son. Can you imagine... Oh, how many people do we have here today? Maybe 50, 60 people? Can you imagine if we all looked and acted like Jesus? Man. Wouldn't that be a trip? Right? But let me ask you another question. When you became born again, is Jesus in you? So what's the problem? We don't want to die. We don't want to give up us. We, 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 we don't want to come out of our comfort zone. We're comfortable on the pew. Mother Teresa... Was she a pew sitter? No. Never. Mm. Do you realize that when she died, almost every dignitary, every world leader either went there or sent their condolences to that woman? Because she was Christ personified. People saw her, they saw Jesus. Imagine if we all did that. If they saw you, they didn't see Dave, they saw Jesus. They didn't see Pastor, they saw Jesus. They didn't see Pastor Mike, they saw Jesus. They didn't see Mary, they saw Jesus. They didn't see Terry, they saw Jesus. They saw Jesus in each and every one of us. How powerful would your church be then? How powerful would it be when you tell somebody with cancer, come to church, meet Jesus. Get healed. Better yet, I'm going to pray for you right at your house because I have a relationship with my father that I know you'll be healed. Can you imagine that? But let me ask you a question. What did the disciples do? Didn't they go around healing people? Wasn't Peter a hothead? Always put his foot in his mouth? Always started yelling, screaming at people, cut somebody's ear off. Somebody tried to take Jesus, took out the sword, cut the guy's ear off. Jesus said, we don't operate that way. And Jesus goes to put the ear back on. Yes. And they took him anyway. How stupid is that? <laughs> but think about it. We're operating that way. The apostles went around and laid hands on people. Some of them were so anointed, all they did was walk past somebody, and their shadow went over them, and they were healed. <laughs> they are no different than you and I. Right. With the exception of their passion and desire. Wow. Amen? Prefer others more highly than you prefer yourself. You need to come out of our self-centeredness, church. Amen? Yeah. If we're going to grow, you're going to come out of you. We have Melissa standing at the door, freezing this morning. Colleen standing at the downstairs door, freezing this morning. Not complaining. Why? Because they don't want to miss new people coming into that door. Is that Jesus in action? Mm. Coming to church today and looking to be a benefit and a blessing as opposed to getting a blessing, is that Jesus in action? Yes. Better believe it. Coming up and praying for people after service. Yes. Jesus in action. Mm -hmm. Making sure the elderly have heat in their home. Is that Jesus in action? Yes. Amen. Meeting a need is Jesus in action. The church needs to come out of the me syndrome. Me, 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 me. It's not about me. It's about me when I come in. Because when you walk in those doors and you're sick and you're beat up and you don't know what end is up, it is about you. And Jesus says, come and sit and be healed, be ministered to. After that, get up. Get moving. Pay it forward. What pro the problem comes in is, you ever seen the, the cartoon character Garfield? I don't know why this just came into my head. <laughs> but you know some cartoons where he just sits and eats and eats and eats and he gets bigger and bigger and bigger? That's Christians. They'll sit in a pew. I'm new. I'm a new person. You say, oh, cool, no problem. But you're not new after five years. 
You're fat and lazy after five years. You're fat and lazy after a year. Six, seven, eight months. If I'm reading this word, day, if I'm reading this word daily, am I going to change? We know Pastor Steve from New Life Worship Center, right? When I first became a pastor, I found out that he does not minister to people one on one. And I said, gee, that's not pastor like, is it? So I was getting all judgmental. I was actually mad at him. How dare he do that? Bah, 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 bah. I was upset. So I found out why. He said, people want me to solve their problem. I'm not a problem solver. He is. So before you come to pastor or to somebody else, guess who you should be going to? Jesus. Jesus. So his thing was, I'm going to challenge you. Bring your problem to the Lord. Open the word. Read it for 30 days. Pray and seek it out for 30 days. If you still have the problem, then I'll talk to you. Guess how many people come to see him when they do that? No. Because, let me tell you something. When I have a problem, I'm not running around calling people. I'm coming here or wherever, and I'm saying, I messed up. I got a problem. What am I going to do with it? Lord, I'm here. And I'm seeking it out. And guess what happens? Doors begin to open. Well, how did that change? Who do you know about that? What about this? What about, no, no, no. It's all my God. It's all my God that did it. Amen? It's all that it is. When you're here for a certain amount of time, what should happen? I should be able to see the fruits of the Spirit in you, yes? So if you're reading, studying, praying, seeking after God, putting your life down, really believing what God has for you, I should start seeing the fruit of the Spirit, right? Let's check out what those are. Let's go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Now, I'm almost done, so don't get nervous. It's actually cold in here, and I'm sweating. Whew, okay, Galatians chapter 5. When you say, get there, say amen. amen. Okay. All right. Let's pick it up in verse, let's see. Let's pick it up in 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? What does walk in the Spirit mean? <clears throat> Stay, yeah, staying with Jesus, staying in tune with Jesus, staying connected. Yes. Doesn't John 15 say, if you abide in me and I abide in you, ask me anything, you will be done for you? Because apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. 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 You can do nothing apart from me. You can't breathe apart from me. You can't think apart from me. You cannot love apart from me. You can do nothing. That's a sobering thought. When people say, well, I'm a self-made man. You ain't self-made nothing. God blessed you. Because just as hard as the executive works, so does the garbage man. Yes? No? Maybe so? Yes. So they each work hard, but one's pay is different. But God blesses. Yes? Right, yeah. yes. So we can't use that as a prideful thing. Amen? Amen. It's going to be, we have to understand what God is doing. Okay. So it says, walk in the spirit and you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that they cannot do the things that you would. When you become born again, you have a true, true conversion to Christianity. Guess what happens? When you walk into a bar like you did before, it's no longer fun. Right. Or, yep. if it is, when you wake up the next morning, the Holy Spirit comes to you and says, how's your head feeling? That's right. You feeling good today? Now the conviction comes in. Oh my God. Uh, yep. okay. I shouldn't have done that. No, nah, no, nah, you shouldn't have. But we're in, we're in transition. But this is how you know you're born again, because you can't do the things that you used to do and like it. Amen. Right. You feel very uncomfortable. There's this warring of the Spirit. Amen? Yeah. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Let's jump up to 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. And let me stop with goodness. Goodness not as the world gives good or identifies as good. Because there's a big difference. 
We have a book by John. B what? Can you ever pronounce his last name? Bivier. Good is. What's the name of the book you gave me? I have. I haven't. Seen. Good or God. Good or God. Who said that? You got it too. Good or God. It defines what God's good is, and what the world's good is. And you know what he believes in the last days? What's going to happen? People are going to confuse the two. Because there's a goodness in the world that is not a goodness to God. Right. Think about that. So when it says goodness here, he's not talking about the world's good. It's about God's goodness. Faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified. Oh, those that are of Christ have crucified the flesh and the affections thereof. Who crucified the flesh? They did. They did. Because Jesus is not going to put you on the cross. You're going to get there yourself. You're going to crucify your flesh. He's not going to do it for you. He's going to give you the option. Do you want to be like me or do you want to stay like you? See, do we want to be like you? Do, do we really, really want to be like Jesus or do we just pretend? Is it cool to pretend that we're Christians so we can, we can live with ourselves better? Because guess who you're not fooling? We're not fooling him. Because he knows your heart. He knows, he, listen, when Adam and Eve sinned and he went looking for them, did he know where they were? Yes. 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 He went. He said, Adam, where are you? Do you know what that question was for? Do you know where you are spiritually? Do you know that you just died? Do you know where you are? Do you know where you're going? That was the question God was asking. He's asking the same question. Where are you? Church of Jesus Christ, where are you? Are you hiding? Putting on a facade? This looks good. But inside, Jesus says to the Pharisees, you, you look good on the outside. But man, on the inside, you're as dry bones. Dead man's bones. See, you can look good. See, we can, can't we come to church looking great? We get our suits, our, 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 our stuff, and we look good when we come in, right? We took a shower, thank God, most of us, amen? Right. We come into the church, and all of a sudden you walk in the door, you're arguing with your wife before you get here. But the minute you get into the parking lot, Christian needs kicks in. Ooh, okay. Good morning, brother. Sister, how are you? God bless you. How are things going? Praise God, brother. They're going great. You're such a liar. You're such a liar. I'm not saying go tell your problems to people, but if you're struggling, say, you know what? Praise God. God's taking care of it, but I'm struggling here. Yeah. Doing fine, brother. You know, God is just blessing me day by day, and oh, everything's glorious. Mm, I don't think so. Because I can tell you, my days aren't glorious, all of them either. There's days I got problems, and I got issues. And I call people and say, hey, talk to me about this. Amen? But we gotta get, we got to get real. The church has got to get real. Pastors have got to get real. We had a conversation about this. Pastors sometimes put themselves up here. When I first got born again, and God says, I'm going to call you to do what he does, I'm like, oh, no, you're not. I can't live like that. <laughs> come to find out he didn't live like that either. You know what I mean? It's like, come on. Pastors are just like us. Just like you and I. We're no different. you got to stop putting these people on a pedestal. Do you guys watch TV, the televangelists? Do you put them on a pedestal? Because I could use a plane, too, that costs $65 million. Wouldn't that be great, Mike? <laughs> having a church, having a, hey, I'm collecting 60, you know, what, what do you call that? What do you go, go fund me? Go oh, fund yeah. How cool would that be? Yeah. Go fund pastor's plane. <laughs> you don't need a $65 million plane, fool. What you need is a kick in the pants. Because what you can do with $65 million is feed the homeless. Right. Build orphanages, build shelters. Right. You don't need a plane. American Airlines has that covered for you. It's called first class. I didn't even give you first class. You should fly coach. Be like everybody else. But do you see the mentality of churches versus those that want to be with Jesus? I don't want a $20 million building. I want a building that we can fit people in. Yeah. I want a building that we can, that we can make an impact yeah. for Christ in this country, in this city, in this state. I, I don't need to have a water fountain in the middle of my church. It doesn't fit. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But can we use money for something else? Yes. Yes, we can. So you never see a fountain in the church, guys. Praise God. Amen? <laughs> Man. Okay, I'm going to close with this. 
when you come into the church, you have got to find where you fit in. Once you're here, you begin your healing process, you get into a relationship with Jesus, you get to hear from Jesus, you get to understand a little bit more, and you're growing. Now, you have guys, have guys, God's going to give you giftings. Teachers, prophets, evangelists, this, that. You have the ministry of administration. You have the ministry of helps. There are so many things. And you're going to find that in 1 Corinthians 2. I won't get into that because we're going to be going a little bit, a little bit long. But there's giftings that you're going to be able to tap into. God gives you those. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you, but why else? He wants you to help who? Other people. Other people. The homeless. Yeah. Each and every one of you, listen to me. Have you ever seen a big jigsaw puzzle? That's the church. When that jigsaw puzzle is together, beautiful picture, it, um, it, it emerges. But if I start taking pieces out, now the picture becomes not so pretty, not so whole. Each and every one of us, guess what, is a puzzle piece. I'm a puzzle piece. Dave's a puzzle piece. Dennis is a puzzle piece. That little baby is a puzzle piece growing into the kingdom. Does that make sense? We put these puzzle pieces together and they form this glorious picture. If everybody moves in what God has gifted them in and moves faithfully, that picture is amazing. The church becomes this powerful, powerful house of God. Does that make sense? So you can't sit in a pew and say, I don't know what to do. No. You better be telling me I don't want to do anything because that's more accurate. See, I'm into being realistic. I'm into being very true with you. Don't give me, well, I don't know what to do, Pastor. I, I, find a need and meet it. It's not rocket science. If somebody is elderly, I'm going to go and make sure they have what they need. If someone is sick in the hospital, I'm going to go and visit. Do you need an invitation to do that? No. no. Jesus says, go. Feed my hungry. Go to the jails. I hated going to the prison. Thank God I haven't had to go back there. I'm a big guy, so if you're, if you're taking my belt off, my pants are going to fall. <laughs> I didn't want to go. This was going back quite a few years ago. I said to God, I'm not going to the prison. That's not my ministry. I said, I am not going. I had to go to the ACI. I'll never forget it. And God says, what did my word say? I'm like, oh, fine, I'll go. I went. They took my belt. They made me take my shoes, everything. And I have to walk up these. First of all, it's scary. I had to walk up those stupid stairs to get to the cafeteria. I had to hold my pants because I was afraid they're going to fall down. And you're walking in, there's all convicts around you. You want to talk about getting the mind of Jesus right then and there? Because guess what? They need him. That person I spoke to needed him. I didn't feel like going, but I knew that's what the Word of God said. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was naked, you clothed me. Well, pastor, I don't know what to do. Go to the prison. What about going to an elderly home and just visiting with people? What about going to, to people that, that need just meals on wheels? There is, please don't tell me you don't know what to do. Tell me you don't want to do it. Because if you're attentive to the Holy Spirit, it'll just flood. He'll keep you so busy and make your head spin. But that's what the church of Jesus has to look like. And that's what it has to feel like. When we walk in the door, I'm going to close with this. When we walk in the door, do you feel the love of God or no? <laughs> do you? I do. I do. And, and there, there are variations of it. But we're family. We know each other. So we've already be, begun to have that molding process, that rubbing process, that, that affiliation. You know, we're going on 10 years in ministry. But what if a new person walked in that door? Would they feel they the love? They should. Right. My question is, Gina. do they? Mm. Because if you, and we talked about this last week, if you're oblivious mm. to the new person, like I said to you last week, not, not to rehash this, but people walk in the door so I can see the new people that walk in or people that I'm not familiar. So I said, I have to go down and meet them. But I get caught up here. And then I'll go downstairs and I'll say to people, who was the new person that was here? What? What? There was a new person here? Are you blind? Are you blind? There were two. <laughs> what do you mean you didn't see them? Did they not walk around? Did you not say hello to them? How? 
When I'm seeing a new person walk around, I'm thinking to myself, oh dear God, please let somebody grab a hold of these people. Because God knows by the time I get downstairs, they're going to be gone. That's right. So if a new person comes around, you need to stop, get out of your conversation, get out of your head, get out of your own way, and say, hey, thanks for coming to church today. I'm brother so-and-so. I'm glad you're here. Can we help you in some way? Do you need any information? They'll either tell you yes, and you can go into it, or they'll say, no, thank you, I'm just here. Perfect. We even talked about this last week. What if you brought somebody in from your job? Now, you've been ministering to her, ministering to her, ministering to her, ministering to her. And finally, they said, you know what? I'm going to shut Dennis up. I'm just going to go with you. Please, I'm just going to go with you. In my head, on the way here, I'm thinking, oh, dear God, please let somebody acknowledge this guy. Please let somebody be friendly to this guy. Why should that even become a question? Shouldn't that be the norm? Shouldn't that be how we should operate? <laughs> every day? Why don't we? Yes. Well, Pastor, I was busy in conversation. Ah. So was Jesus. And he heard. He saw. He observed. The problem with us is we get comfortable. You can't get comfortable. You've always got to be alert. Especially in leadership. You've always got to be scanning. When I'm up here, I'm scanning for leaders. People who are showing themselves faithful. People who I see potential in. People who I see going above and beyond what they should be doing. Ministries that are growing. Ministries that are flourishing. Paying attention to what the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding us to be. And so should you. God, where do you need me? Where's this new person? I'm not telling you to marry the guy. I'm telling you to say hello to him. Just say, hey, how are you? Have you met Pastor yet? Well, Pastor's upstairs. Let me introduce you to Pastor Mike. Let me, let me introduce you to some of the eldership of the church. Is that that difficult? Sir, do you know where the bathroom is? I don't know about you, but when I go to a place, I need to know where the bathroom is. I don't want to have to go and then be looking for it. Tell somebody, hey, you know, just so you know, you know, I know you knew, the bathrooms are downstairs and to your right. I'm not asking you to take them for dinner. Just acknowledge them. That's what the Church of Jesus Christ is all about. Let's stand. When we start operating that way, people are going to fall over to get here. We've got to become more like Jesus. I look at myself and, I, and I look, sometimes <laughs> I get so frustrated like at home or whatever the case is and my mind just goes in nine different directions and I just said, you know what God, I, I am so, so not complete. I'm just such a mess. You know what I'm, but thank God, it's like I come to God and, and He says, you know what, get up, uh, you just keep going. Just keep moving. I'll transform you, provided you want to be transformed. Amen. And that has to be where every one of us has to be. It's going to be a desire to be changed. We've got to live. Let me ask you a question. When you go to work in the morning, is that something you do intentionally? Yep. What? Yeah, what? We do it because we have to do it. Why? We need the money to live. Okay. <laughs> now listen. Now listen. That's true. In Christianity, you have to live intentionally because if I don't, guess what happens? You're fired. I don't transform. What are you, Donald Trump now? <laughs> <laughs> You're fired. fired. You get out. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're going to live intentionally. Yeah. If, if, if I want to find somebody who has a need, i got, I got to be intentionally looking. If, I'm, if, I'm, if Christ is in me, I'm constantly looking, who can I bless? Who can I help? It doesn't necessarily have to be here in the church. It could be in your apartment complex. Who has a need that I can meet, that we can bless? Always be on the lookout for that. And they'll say, what's, what's strange about you? Why are you doing this? This makes no sense. Well, it does if you know who Jesus is. Right. And now here's a door that opens. You have to know where Jesus is. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you for this day. Father, we just come before you. Father, we know we're not perfect. And Father, thank God that you accept us anyway. We're all a work in progress. And there is never any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But Father, we need to start living intentionally the way Jesus did. We need to sit at Jesus' feet and intentionally turn the pages of the book and learn of him. Father, we need to put time aside out of our busy day to spend time in fellowship with you, that you may lead and guide us, that we could turn into the ambassadors that Jesus wants us to be.
Father, that wherever we go, people will say, what's different about you? And even if they don't question us, they'll leave us wondering, wow, those people were very nice. There was something different about those people. Those people were refreshing. And Father, keep planting that seed and keep watering that so that person can get saved. Father, turn us into the ambassador of Christ that you want us to be. And not just talking heads, not just pew sitters, Lord, but active Christians walking in the power of the Most High God. Just like the disciples did of old. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. And Father, as we leave today, I ask you to bless your people, cause them to be above and not beneath, cause them to be the head and not the tail. Father, bless them in their travels, keep them safe today. Father, keep them warm and keep the heat turned on, O oh God. Father, and just bless the people, Lord, who are homeless today. Father, grant them shelter for the evening. And Father, let, let us be a powerhouse in this state to make changes in every way that we can. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Be blessed, guys. Have a great